When Robert the Bruce went into hiding in the winter of 1306, he did so kind of down on his luck, like Gandalf the Grey. And when he re-emerged again in the spring of 1307, he did so as a rejuvenated Gandalf the White. Maybe that's like maybe that's why his statue got defaced. Like someone wasn't happy that he came back as the White One. I don't know. But after his success at the Battle of Loudon Hill, Robert the Bruce. He stuck with the tactics that had proved so successful to him up to that point. The guerrilla tactics, whereby he would travel with his group of hardened followers, picking up supporters wherever he went. He, was like, he travelled like an aggressive Jesus, as it were. Moving through Argyll, the Western Highlands, and up the Great Glen Way. Taking Inverlochy, Inverness, Uckert and Elgin castles like a fucking Instagram influencer. And by the time is. Rabbi's tour of the north had been completed. Robert the Bruce controlled all of Scotland north of the Forth. Edward II, in 1310, he embarked on a kind of pointless expedition of southern England, just bouncing between English garrisons. It's a bit like when, when Boris Johnson visits Scotland and he goes to like a distillery in Elgin. You're like, aye, that's it, Boris. That's going to make all the difference, big man. And as soon as Edward left, Robert the Bruce set about gaining control of southern Scotland. But the Bruce, he didn't have a standing army or he didn't have siege equipment to take any of the castles in southern Scotland. So he relied on audacious um, attempts at raids. So, for example, in Perth, where his men swum the moat and then used specially made rope ladders to climb the castle walls, mistaking Perth Castle for Takeshi's Castle, apparently. Or in Linlithgow, when they used a haywain cart as a Trojan horse. Or in Roxburgh, where they dressed as cattle to edge closer and closer to the castle. Really, really amazing stuff. And in March 1314, they got the jewel in the crown, Edinburgh Castle. Robert the Bruce's nephew, Sir Thomas Randolph, he was approached by a, a local man, Willie Francis, who told him of a secret route up the north crag of the castle. So Robert the Bruce's men, they attacked the East Gate, the main entrance to the castle. And as the English soldiers were defending the main entrance, Thomas Randolph and his men, they snuck up the north side of the castle, again using specially made ladders. They threw their ladders over the top of the castle walls. They climbed up the ladders and overrun the castle. It's one hell of a, a way to go to avoid paying the £18 entrance fee, but it certainly is the only way that you'll ever get a local to actually visit Edinburgh Castle. And after taking Edinburgh Castle, the only castle in Scotland that remained in, under English control was Stirling Castle, which was thought to be impregnable, uh, unlike Dundee Castle, which, you know, got impregnated at 16. And so Robert the Bruce, he sent his brother Edward um, to besiege Stirling Castle, but instead of sieging the castle... Edward, he reached an agreement with a constable of Stirling Castle. And the agreement was... If an English army hadn't arrived in Stirling at Stirling Castle to relieve the castle by the 24th of June, 1314, Midsummer's Day, then he would surrender to the Scots army. Now, Robert the Bruce was not happy about this at all. The whole point of his tactics up to that point had been to avoid an open pitch battle against the English. Robert the Bruce knew that even with home advantage, he would be heavily outnumbered and almost certainly defeated. Uh, it's a bit like being a Hamilton fan, you know? The English army hadn't been defeated in an open pitch battle since the Norman invasion of 1066. And, and Robert the Bruce's brother, the arrangement he had made with the Constable of Stirling Castle, meant that a battle was now inevitable. But at least Robert the Bruce knew where the battle was going to take place and when it was going to take place. So he had an opportunity to prepare. And once again, the Shilterns, these were the, the spearmen that would have been so key in William Wallace's army. They would be key again in Robert the Bruce's army. But the Bruce, he would teach them to be as effective in defence and in attack. It's known as the Andy Robertson method. And a big chunk of Robert the Bruce's army, it was made up of small folk. These were just volunteers, like farmers, labourers, builders, who arrived with their own homemade uh, weapons. And so Robert the Bruce, he set up his army on the old Roman road, blocking the route to Stirling Castle by means of a, an utterly bizarre one-way system that still exists to this day. You kind of get fucking near the thing. And when the English vanguard appeared through the Tor Wood on the 23rd of June, 1314, they saw the Scots and they immediately charged. They didn't wait for backup or anything like that. No reinforcements. And one of the English knights, a guy by the name of Henry de Boon, he spotted Robert the Bruce addressing his troops and he saw that the Bruce was only on a, a small grey pony armed with a, with a wee hand axe. 
And so seeing his opportunity for infamy, he said, uh, boom, boom, shake, shake, da boon. Uh, tick, 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 boon. And he started charging towards Robert the Bruce, right? And the Bruce, he seen him coming. And he stood up in his stirrups and he shouted, Go ahead, you fucking ball bag, right? And with one swing of his axe, he split Henry the Boone's skull in two. His men went absolutely berserk and they were spoiling for a fight. And the next day, on the 24th of June, 1314, the first engagement came at daybreak, about half past three in the morning, at the Stirling taxi rank. And the Shultons, they attacked the English knights. It would have, it would have looked like the equestrian centre at the Olympics being invaded by the pole vaulters, you know? And the battle was in the balance. It was on edge, could go either way. And the turning point in that battle was the small folk, was the regular people, was the volunteers. When they came charging out of the new forest, they made all the difference, like 2,000 Marcus Rashfords. The English, they started to flee. And Edward II, he actually had to be pulled off of the battlefield. It's amazing, isn't it? Like back in those days when your leaders, they would fight alongside you, you know, like Edward II and, and Robert the Bruce. And now, like, now what have you got? You've got a guy who hides in fridges and is scared the bloody Piers Morgan, for Christ's sake. And so Edward II, he, uh, they, they, they rode him up to Stirling Castle. Uh, but he was refused entry because he was wearing trainers. And also because if they had actually accepted Edward into the castle, he would have to then be... Um, surrendered to the Scots army. So Edward, he was sent to a waiting ship in Dunbar and the battle was a victory for the Scots. Robert the Bruce had pulled off an incredible victory against English, the most memorable victory in Scottish history, maybe even the most important moment in Scottish history. Robert the Bruce had defeated the English army, making it Scotland one, England a million. And although the battle was won, the war was yet over. Robert the Bruce had solidified his place as King of Scots, but only in Scotland. He still needed the approval of the Pope, and he was still under an excommunication after his murder of John Common in 1306. And so a, a lofty letter would be drafted and sent to the Pope. And that letter would be known as the Declaration of Arbroath, the most important document in Scottish history. And that's what I'm going to speak to you guys about next time thank you so much for listening